Hi, welcome to the Macabre Emporium. Let me get my emotional support cat. Okay. <laughs> to be quiet and keep the kids quiet, since he was getting anxiety and he didn't want to kill children. Gertrude's daughter even got to join in on what they considered fun. Tell us about the giant turtle. Alan never showed up, nor was he ever heard from again beyond that point. Welcome back to Macabre Emporium. This is episode 27B or 28, Bath Township Bombing and Andrew Kehoe. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're now listening to this as the first episode, you really need to go back to last week's to make this week's episode to make more sense to you. Yes. Before I get started, I realized after the episode was released that I forgot to add some information in on last week's episode due to some random error that happened when typing the script out probably one of the shop cats throwing up or whatever nah having to clean it up but when i was telling sarah about how much andrew kehoe was getting taxed i told her the overall value of him being his property taxes being the total value of his property he was actually getting taxed approximately three hundred dollars a year which comes out to be about $2,000 to $3,000 today mm-hmm. is what he was having to pay. For the whole year? Well, for his share of the taxes, for what he had to pay into something he wasn't using readily because okay. he didn't have children. And also that the farm is not 185 acres. It was 80 acres in size. If you haven't listened to the first episode of what's probably going to be like three episodes now because... I wanting to make sure to do this correctly and not trying to cram it all into an hour like we normally do. I'm pretty confident to say that next week will probably be the last and final part of this. And there's a lot of information that goes on with this that doesn't really get thrown out there. So, but I'm also going to warn issue of somewhat of a trigger warning. There's going to be a talk a lot of child death in next week's episode because I'm going to be doing a lot of survivor tales of may 18th right which is what we're going to be getting into today yeah the day of this is more of the day before and then part of the next day yeah okay because i have this fascination of leaving people on cliffhangers yep well not a fascination obsession and finding the right spot because your reaction tells me yep that was the right spot yep So as I ended last week, I said that Andrew Kehoe's behavior became more erratic over time. So this is going to be starting off with some of those behaviors for the most part. Okay. So Struth. getting started with that, Monty Ellsworth that owned the town gas station. He witnessed a lot of the stuff being very living very close to the Kehoe farm and knowing him like throughout the community. Mm-hmm. Monty Ellsworth witnessed Andrew Kehoe's erratic behavior firsthand more than most people. As he believe, as he lived only about 300 yards away from Andrew Kehoe's farm, and didn't say if it was like the house or the property line, but I'm going to assume that he could see a lot from where his home slash gas station was at. And in 1925, this is when he would purchase a tenant house from Andrew Kehoe for $250 and that in that it was odd that Andrew demanded that the entire payment up front instead of half now and the other how, half when this house would be delivered as it was standard practice for deals like this. Mm-hmm. It's not clear if Ellsworth was aware of Andrew Kehoe's money problems at the time when he did this. So he's, Andrew demanded like, no, I want them all the money now because I'm wanting to use it right now, but didn't say for what. Mm-hmm. I mean, did he really have to back then? No. It just probably seemed a little odd that I want all the money now and that I'm going to do it like half now, half later. Mm-hmm. And then also another time, Monty Ellsworth would remember that Andrew would be talking about the current weather that they were having with their cold nights and warmer temperatures during the day. And Monty would tell them that this isn't good for this wheat weather, which... But what caught Monty Ellsworth off surprise was that... 
Andrew Kehoe snapped back at him and said no, and I'm glad of it. The farmers ought to not raise any more wheat until the country needs it badly. The demand these damn farmers would never be any better off than they are now because if they do raise anything, they will brag about it to anyone else. He was referring to like a farmer in northern Michigan that like doubled his crop production for the previous year and was going around bragging about it. David Hart that lives across the street from them. He would also find it odd that in 1926 that Andrew Kehoe would just let his corn rot in the fields that year and not bring in threshers to finish off the job. But after all, he was known for being a bit odd and eccentric for the, the area, like I mentioned in last week, due to him wearing him wearing a smoking jacket and mm -hmm. being dressed to the nines for a night out of the town, however you want to call it. Dapper farmer. Yeah. Also... This is during this summer break is where it was believed that Andrew Kehoe would devise his plan to become the world's worst demon while doing the school's electrical work. That was a name that he was given by some newspapers across the country after this disaster had happened. Okay. I mean, fitting. Yeah. As 1926 turned into 1927, Bath New Year's Eve celebrations would be disturbed by explosions from the Kehoe farm. It might have felt as if Bath was under attack as massive explosions pierced the silence and white flashes lit up the night sky around the Kehoe farm on the first day of the new year. Harry Cushman of Bath would run into Job Slate asking him if he had heard any explosions. Job's response probably got him the reputation of Bath sound sleeper as he would tell Cushman no and, and chalked it up to Kehoe shooting off the old year. Days after this, Job Slate and his wife would visit Andrew and Nellie since she was just released from one of her many hospital stays due to her illness of tuber tuberculosis. After a few pleasantries, Job would ask, I heard you were shooting off dynamite on New Year's Eve, Kehoe would answer him with, Yes, I thought I'd shoot off some. I set some out, I wired it up, and set it for midnight. Laughing to himself after this explanation, I guess I jarred them up. My best guess to this is, was an acceptable answer an acceptable answer for Slate, as Andrew was known for tinkering all of his life with gadgets and electricity. Like, one of the things that people remembered was him trying to attach two lawnmowers behind his tractor at the time to either maintain the lawn or the, around the farm or mm -hmm. one of the animal pastures or whatnot, but he could never get it to work. Oh. Uh -huh. It was probably, like, from farmers at that time probably had never seen anything like that before. Yeah. You know, if it... If he probably could have gotten that to work, he could probably bank some money off that, and this probably never would have happened. February, by the time February would come around, no, no mortgage payments were being made to the price of state for the farm. And at about the same time, a professor from Michigan State College would show interest in buying the property and making an offer of $12,000, the same as Andrew made in 1920. But later, he would end up re withdrawing his offer due to the high property taxes. By the end of March, two more offers would be would come and fall through. Even though Kehoe was offered equity in an unnamed property, he would consult James Dunnebeck, which is kind of surprising because it's the state lawyer, mm -hmm. for some legal advice about the sole equity in the unknown property. <clears throat> and James would tell him that he isn't too crazy about this deal himself and it would put him in a very bad spot to negotiate. And then by mid-April, these two would meet for the last time where Dunnebeck would ask about the deal and Andrew told him he didn't accept it. And part of Kehoe's duties of treasurer was to pass out paychecks to school employees. About every 20 days he would go from classroom to classroom giving the teachers their check and what they would describe in a cold voice with no expression and it would tell each one of them when passing them their hand while well, passing them their paycheck. Well, it's another month. Mm. That's it. That was the only, the only description of what he said. But when it would come to Superintendent Hayek's check, he would tend to forget to bring it to Hayek's office or possibly misplaced it temporarily. Misplaced it. Yeah. yeah. In early May, Janitor Frank Smith would find the back door split around its lock on his night duties of making sure the school was secure. With some effort, he would be able to get this door to lock, but eventually it would unlock. And of course, Kehoe would be called in to make some repairs. But unfortunately, this lock can no longer be repaired at this point. So it would end up being removed and sent to Lansing for repairs. So I'm going to guess this wasn't some kind of throwaway lock. But mm -hmm. then again, in those times, a lot of stuff wasn't throwaway yeah. go to the hardware store. So they fixed more of their own stuff. Unless this was some special type of lock that they had purchased for the school 
As some of these might seem a bit irrelevant, but after the bombing, many townsfolk would say I had never knew a saner man regarding Kehoe, so I decided to put these in to show how little everyone knew what he was really planning. Hmm. I mean, like, so this is like him, like what I was just reading you, this was like normal behavior stuff that he would do. Mm-hmm. Didn't lead on to anything, what he was doing, and it, that's probably why it was such a shock to everybody that when they come to find out that it was him. But all these little things are going to add up and be like all right. pieces falling into place for him to do what he's going to do. Right. Like, throughout the summer of 26, this is when they believe, like, he planned most of this. And even mm-hmm. one of the residents that lived near the school would see somebody going in and out of the school after dark, carrying stuff and something, but never told the police about it. But it's like, at the same time, it's like, oh, it's Ke- Andrew Kehoe. He's seen around the school doing stuff all the time, so probably didn't pay no mind to it either with him carrying stuff and it's probably like yeah. things to repair the school. But I tried my best to try and fit where I believe that this probably fit in the timeline of events. Mm-hmm. Andrew Kehoe would also then go ask local man Alan McMullen if he had any use for a horse. Alan would tell him that he could probably use one, but every once in a while... And Andrew would tell him to come and get one as the horses are tearing up his barn. Kehoe would ask him how much he would pay for one, but McMullen wasn't interested in buying the animal. To McMullen's surprise, Andrew Kehoe would come to McMullen's farm with a horse named Kit he had offered days before. One evening while Alan was having dinner with mutual friends of his and Kehoe, Andrew Kehoe himself would actually arrive. After talking for shop for a few minutes, as he would say about farming... Mm-hmm. Andrew reaches into his pocket and hands McMullen a piece of paper. And since McMullen didn't have his glasses, Andrew, being the helpful neighbor that he was, would re- read it out to him. May 4th, 1927. Received from Alan McMullen. $120 in full payment for one bay mare. 10 years old, blind and left eye. Weight, 1,800 pounds. Name kit. $120. AP Kiho. So he literally came over to the neighbor's house just to give him a receipt for a horse that he didn't even want to fucking buy. Did he actually give him the horse, though? Yeah, he actually did. Yeah, days beforehand, he actually did come by with the horse with attack, and so he took the horse after all since he brought the horse all the way over there. Okay. He had also offered Andrew a ride back home since it was somewhat of a walk for him. He's like, nope, I'm fine with walking. McMullen really first thought this was a gift at first until... He showed up at this friend's house and gave him this receipt. Yeah. Even though Andrew spent his morning in Lansing visiting his wife Nellie in the hospital once again, unfortunately, Alan McMullen would take a chance to see if he was home and return the horse. After knocking on the front door and the back door of the Kehoe home, he wouldn't get an answer. He would then visit the hearts across the road where he found out that he had seen a light on late on a light on late into the night. Even after Trying to reach him by phone in the heart home, he would still not get an answer of some sort. After a few more attempts of knocking on the door, McMullen would start to think the worst that would start to think maybe that he had hung himself. Trying once more, he finally would trying once more, he finally would be answered by Kehoe, half dressed, asking what's the matter? Are you going to kill yourself in your sleep? McMullen would ask, but Andrew's response with would, would respond with It wouldn't be a bad way to die, would it? with a grin the fuck yeah like his like i said his behavior started to get erratic people were actually starting to get worried about him because of him not taking care of his field yeah and other bizarre behaviors that he started showing up to this point Mm -hmm. after giving kehoe reasons why he didn't want this horse days later mcmullen would finally get kit back to andrew kehoe would tell him after putting the horse in its stable you made a mistake by not keeping that horse over there to which McMullen offered no response to Andrew's odd choice of words. So what, like he was going to take it out on the horse that McMullen didn't keep him? No, I didn't say. He just or assumed. Well, it could be because he had been spotted once before, mm-hmm. years prior, whipping a horse to death, basically, for right. not being able to pull hard enough. It was a regular sight for David Hart and his wife to see Andrew coming home late at night. He would assume that... This was just him finally returning home from visiting Nellie at St. Lawrence Hospital in Lansing. But by mid-April, he would start to notice that Andrew's trips to Lansing were increasing and sometimes have tarp-covered boxes in his truck. And Kehoe would never spoke a word to David Hart about what he was doing. 
Mm-hmm. Tarp covered boxes. Interesting, right? Mm-hmm. As payday came around again while giving bus driver Ward keys his paycheck, Ward's foot would slip from the clutch, causing the bus to start rolling. And acting quickly to stop the bus from rolling, Ward jumped back in to stop it. As his paycheck floated down to the ground, Kiho would tell him, You better keep that. That might be the last one you ever get. Taking this as a joke from Andrew Kiho, he would say back to him, Are you going broke? Kiho's only response was, I guess not. Huh. It was known for years that Kiho wasn't too happy about Ward Keys driving the bus, but never held it against him. Never understood why, probably just because it was an added expense on the school having him mm-hmm. another bus driver. Even with Ward making occasional trips past his farm, Kehoe's farm, if the weather was bad, he generally stuck to a back road on the back side of his property instead, unless snowing or the roads were washed out because the front road to in front of Kehoe's house was paved, so that's probably why he stuck to that one. Yeah, okay. But when he was traveling this road that would go past the front of his farm, Andrew Kehoe would out, be outside by his fence and checking his watch as Ward would pass by with a bus full of kids. Even though neither man ever said anything about these actions, Ward Keys just assumed it was Andrew making sure that the buses were running on time. On the morning of May 13th, Monty Ellsworth would invite Andrew to have a shooting contest between the two of them where they had made the... I came up with this idea like over a year ago. And he was like, you know, let's finally do this. We spent over a year. Let's have this, you know, shooting contest just for fun. Like pew pew guns? Yep. Ugh. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like, oh shit, right? But, <laughs> yeah. Even though having the shooting contest between the two of them, Ellsworth would be quite impressed by how well Andrew was able to keep a steady hand with everything he had going on at the time. He was so impressed with the shot and maybe thought something was wrong with Monty Ellsworth thought something was wrong with his rifle. They would switch. Mm-hmm. Same results. Switch back. Switch. Same results. So this is why he was found this so impressive that he had such a steady hand for me knowing how stressed out by this time Andrew's probably with yeah his money issues and not paying everything with Nelly going on and you know added stress from being part of the school board and maintaining the schools as well and when they're done shooting finally they would return to Kehoe's truck which Ellsworth would notice a half under a half uncovered cart crate holding around an estimated thousand rounds for his Winchester rifle how many? A thousand rounds is what he estimated. Why would you need that many? That's what a lot of people keep now. God. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Just, it sounds like overkill. Well, I mean, it sounds like overkill, but if you go out shooting for a day, you're going to go through quite a few like that. But you don't use your good expensive ammo just to go out sh- randomly shooting. I wouldn't think so. On May 15th, Nelly was to be released from the hospital once again, but the hospital staff would urge him that it was best to come tomorrow on Monday the 16th due to the rain. That this rain could agitate her illness, but the day and just the day before on this also, a road crew in the area would notice boxes of their dynamite was missing and reported it to state police. Mm. Lulu Hart, the wife of David Hart, that lived across the road from them. Yeah. What happened to notice the, that Andrew was starting to load his truck up with old wheels and various pieces of scrap metal. And she would question David, her husband, about this as it wasn't a normal cargo for most farmers to be carrying on the back of their pickup trucks. And she would ask him that if, do you think he's junking all the tools? And which her husband had no response to as to why he was doing it. Mm-hmm. And then also David would also hear through the grapevine that Andrew is trying to sell his horses off. So visiting him and asking how Nellie was doing, Andrew would just to say to him, she's much better and she's off visiting her sisters in Lansing right now. David Hart would notice copper wires running to and to and from a tool shed to a hen house on his property. David Hart would assume that this was just Andrew preparing for consumer power to bring electricity to his farm mm-hmm. because like still at this time, not everybody still had what they called instant electricity. Right. In the terms is what we think of it now. Because they refer to it as instant electricity because if you had power in these times you had to use a gas-powered generator. Okay. Which the school ran off of a gas-powered generator. Even though they couldn't agree on a price for one of these horses, David Hart wouldn't notice anything Wouldn't notice anything out of the ordinary in Andrew's behavior during this visit. I find that hard to believe. 
he's been doing all this other weird shit and he was just totally fine and normal right but he was also known for doing odd things all the time anyway so yeah, that's true maybe like he did some uh, something odd like the wires he's like might have found an odd but no okay maybe he's just running power getting his property lined up ready for it because you know he was an electrical engineer for the mm-hmm. most part so he knew he knew what he was doing the end of the school year would mean fun for the, sc- the school children First grade teacher Bernice Sterling would telephone Andrew about having an end-of-the-year picnic on his farm for her students. She wanted to have this pin this picnic on Thursday the 19th, and that would have been should have been taken as a warning of some sort, as he would go on to tell her, Well, if you're going to have this picnic, you better have it right away. The same day, Nellie's sisters would call asking about her, but he assured them that everything is fine and he was taking her to Jackson soon to visit her friends named Voss that they had knew known when they lived in Tecumseh, Michigan. Mm-hmm. And he would also go on to tell her, and it would do her some good to go and see some old friends, and he would be going back for her on Thursday. That evening, David Hart would notice that Andrew Kehoe was carrying more hay into his chicken coop as he, as he was doing a few days earlier when he came by to possibly purchase one of his horses. Knowing... That Kehoe didn't own any chickens for a few years and would just come to this conclusion that maybe he was just preparing to get back into chicken farming. Because, mm-hmm. you, you know, you're using hay for bedding on the bottom of a chicken yeah. coop and kind of keep the floor semi-clean and sanitary for him. Mm-hmm. May 18th, three days of school left. Early morning thunderstorms would, would have the skies over Bath cracked with bolts of lightning as some kind of bad omen. The bright lights of the Roaring Twenties are finally coming to town as Consolidated Power strung power lines and finally put an end to a reliance on generators. This would make the end of the school year for children and tomorrow would be the final step step into adulthood for the school seniors. Hmm. Bath Township Consolidated School followed the Argarian calendar. This would allow students to attend school from fall to spring to allow them to be out of school for planting all the way into harvest due to the majority of the children being from local farms. Even with electricity now being strung through bath, the school would have to wait a bit longer and still rely on generators for the electricity for the lights and to to run the well pump to to provide water for the school. Frank Smith, the school's janitor, would fire up this generator hours before the children would arrive so everything would be ready for their arrival. On this morning, this, the water pump would be acting up and hold, and he would then hold off on turning on the generators until a repairman would come to take a look at it. As daylight broke, as the storms rumbled off in the distance as they moved away from Bath, Kehoe drove into town to deliver a box to the local post office addressed to Clyde B. Smith of Lansing. But as uh, sc- the post office wasn't open yet, he didn't want to wait a moment longer with his package as it urgently needed to be delivered to Lansing and was sent this package via Railway Express. The railway agent would not have any impression of high explosives danger as this box clearly didn't have its original contents as Kehoe had cut this box down to fit its contents better. Railway agent Huffman assured Kehoe that his package would be on the first train to Langsburg and then on the first train to Lansing from there for morning delivery. Albert Detloff, on his morning errands of getting duck eggs, would spot Andrew Kehoe and would strike up a conversation with him on to find out when the next school board meeting was. During this chat about the school board meeting, Detloff would bring up the faulty water pump to Kehoe asking if he would come take a look at it. More than likely how he found out about this was in passing on mm-hmm. his way to get duck eggs with the two men that are already in there. Not two men, the school janitor. Right. As the two men entered, being Kehoe and Detloff, as the two men entered the school, Kehoe would check his watch and seeing it's 8.25. School's about to begin. We don't have enough time to look at the water pump, but Detloff would remind him that it's only really 7.25 and we have plenty of time before school starts. Hesitating for a moment, yes, we have, Kehoe would reply. This confusion was due to Kehoe keeping his watch set to Eastern time, whereas the school was set up to Central time. This could be due to the majority of the state was on central time until 1931 after the city of Detroit switched to Eastern in 1915. While Detloff and Kehoe looked over the water pump with no conclusions as to what's wrong with it, moving to the school's generator, Frank Smith and Detloff theorized what is wrong with the water pump. Andrew Kehoe is standing there silent as the school's equipment in the basement waiting to be turned on, and then he would suddenly spring to life, snapping at the pair, you know, I'm awfully in a hurry, in an outburst and leaving the basement. Hmm. 
Detloff and Smith would eventually come outside to check to see if the repairman had arrived, but they would find Andrew Kehoe in his truck has left the area. Mm -hmm. Now, the next little bit that I'm going to be reading here up until the end, this is like multiple different things that are happening at the same time. Okay. So I try to make it into a timeline. It's going to sound timeline-like, but you have to remember this is all happening at the same time unless I have an interjected time. Okay. If that makes any sense to you. Yes. Okay. As the children of Bath filled the schoolhouse that the community was so proud to have, their symbol of a bright future on top of a hill in town, hidden away in the north wing is an alarm clock ticking away. Ticking away to fulfill its task. Ticking away to awake anywhere in Bath, Michigan. Ralph Cushman, nine years old, hardly able to contain his excitement for the upcoming three months off to spend with his love of baseball. Goodbye, Mama. I'll be I'll be good. He would shout to his mother as he leaves for school with his sister Josephine, knowing her brother, six years younger than her, could be quite bashful. Offered to sit with him until his time for class. He would tell his sister Josephine, "No, because at nine years old, what would be more embarrassing than being seen with your older sister?" Okay, that's all right. I'll see you at lunchtime. Josephine would tell Ralph. Robert Hart, before leaving for school, would tend to the family's brood of chickens, grabbing his lunch pail as he looked, as his mother looked on as he would leave for the day. See you later, Mom, as he leaves for his day to go attend school. Lola Hart would kiss her mother goodbye as she did every morning. Don't worry if I don't come home at noon. You know I have a test to write this morning and I might faint anyway. Mm. Scenes similar to these would play out across Bath in many homes as the children would rush to school before the 8.30 bell would ring. With the school's generator out at the school, the principal, Floyd Huggett, would call the school to order while using a manual bell on a chain instead. Even though the classes would not actually begin until 8.45, Huggett would then meet with the class of 1927 at the Bath Methodist Church next door to go over their commencement rehearsal for their final graduation ceremony mm -hmm. the next day. Lee Mass, 10 years old, tried to get out of going to school that day using the excuse as hip hurts, but like most moms, she saw right through this and sent him to school that day after all. His teacher, Blanche Hart, would send him off on an errand for her and he would ex happily accept this as any excuse to get out of class was a good one. As he walked through the halls, the breeze coming in through the windows would feel great on his face. Leona Gentekust, a teacher of second grade, was said to be gifted to bring stories to life when she read them aloud to her students. After finishing one tale, her students begged her to read one more, just one more story. Gudekunst would figure one more story wouldn't hurt since their summer vacation is about to start and their minds wouldn't be on the lessons for the day. She would pick up another book about an elf in search of a golden apple, keeping the students from their desks a little longer. Carlton Hollister and his classmates would switch classrooms with their 6th grade peers for a geography test on the second floor. The switch was made as the classroom was considered better to conduct testing in. I tried to find out why they figured this, test, this room was better for testing. Was not able, not able to find an answer. But he would become curious about whose desk he was sitting at. And he would open the lid of this desk to find a book belonging to Galen Hart. A good friend of his that he played with often and attended Sunday school with. But two miles down the road on Clark Road, Lulu Hart's attention would be drawn away from the chickens in her hen house from a thump on the roof. Coming out to see what caused this loud thump, the next thing she would hear was what she thought was a gunshot coming from across the street at the Kehoe farm. Earlier that morning, she had seen him leave around 7 a.m., but now there is smoke rising from the roof of the Kehoe's corn crib before flames would start fighting their way through the open sides of the crib. Running to find her husband David to inform him, to inform him that the Kehoe's corn crib was on fire and then... Together, they would rush back to the front of their property, where they now would see Kehoe's barn as now fully involved in fire. The three-story farmhouse, which was described with more windows than it was walls, is now billowing smoke accompanied by gunshots inside the home. They would shout to his wife and neighbors and the lineman from Consolidated Power coming to aid in the fire, Do not go in there. I'm certain he said it. Wow. West of the Kehoe farm, Sidney Howell and his two boys that weren't named were working in their driveway as Melvin Armstrong stopped by to visit with the Howells moments before this fire started. All three of the Howells would jump into Armstrong, Armstrong's car to see if they could do anything to help Andrew put these fires out, and knowing at this time that they more than likely had started this himself. As they're coming down the road, they can clearly see Kehoe running from the house to his tool shed. Running up to the back door, 
they would see Andrew emerge from the smoke as it was hanging low to the ground, probably due to how humid the air was Mm -hmm. from the early morning thunderstorms in his pickup truck and stopped to remove the funnel that he had placed that was sticking out of the gas tank of his pickup truck and replace the gas cap after taking a peek inside to see how much fuel was inside. And just before the Howells and Armstrong entered the back door of the home, Kehoe would stop them and tell them, You are friends of mine. Don't go in there. Go down to the school. And taking Andrew's advice, they would turn back to the road wire as Kehoe casually walked back to his truck and drove towards Bath. And at 8.45, an innocent alarm clock that was, has been hidden in the north wing would finally make its final tick before ringing and sending electrons racing down wires, snake through the basement. Electrons race to their, their final destination of blasting caps wired to dynamite and pyrotol, waiting to unleash an explosion in horror that not a single soul on Bath was prepared to see. Please check out our website at macabreemporiumpodcast.com. Join our Facebook group by searching Macabre Emporium. Like and subscribe on YouTube at Macabre Emporium Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Macabre Emporium. And if you have any stories of the paranormal, your local true crime, or weird history that you would want us to look into and possibly do an episode on, email us at macabreemporiumpod at gmail.com. Remember to follow, rate, like, review, and share whenever and wherever you can and help us grow our little baby podcast.